Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I work for Disney Research Pittsburgh. It's an R&D group, uh, part of the Walt Disney Company. And uh, we, we focus uh, on interaction design. So uh, we work on novel displays, uh, sensors, and haptic devices. Uh, just really quickly, our group uh, is made up of a really dynamic a uh, set of individuals. We have computer scientists, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, and then we, we mix that up with artists and designers. And then within those groups, uh, I include uh, architects and um, musicians. And I think that that group dynamic allows us to bring a different perspective to, to each project and to, to create unique solutions to uh, these, these problems that I'm going to show. <clears throat> Our sort of large vision is to make everything interactive. And um, I'm going to give you a quick overview of uh, a lot of the work that, uh, that, our, that our group has done. You can go online and find later on, uh, which is a little bit more hardware-based uh, electronics. Um, and then I'm going to delve into uh, my specific interest, which is in optically clear uh, printed, 3D printed material. So this first project is called Tesla Touch. Uh, it provides haptic feedback on capacitive touch screens uh, by injecting a signal into uh, the screen and grounding through the user. Uh, what you can do is take that really smooth screen, uh, which has just a super consistent feel, and start to differentiate uh, different areas on the screen. So as you're sliding your finger across, you could tell the difference between the sky or the, uh, the, the flower that you see here. And you can do the same thing by, by adding that same effect to, to materials uh, using conductive, uh, ma conductive paints and uh, a, uh, a dielectric uh, on top of that. And so we're starting to take uh, interfaces and move them away from the, the computer and, and into the, the real world. So that uh, continues with some of our sensing work. We, we built a, a sensor called Touche, which uh, is based on the principle of swept frequency capacitance sensing. And basically what it does is it injects a, a signal into any type of conductive material and uh, gets this, uh, this signature back. Uh, it's testing capacitance at different frequencies. So what that allows us to do, and you know, we're all about making magical experiences at Disney, is to turn plants into input devices. So again, we're, we're shifting that, uh, that interface away from the screen and the keyboard and out into the real world, into the environment around us. So here you can see he's touching the plant, and it's picking up the, that touch location. Uh, and uh, it was, it's coupled with sounds in this case. I don't have the sound on. but uh, This is a project called Side by Side, where we are embedding uh, infrared uh, uh, augmented reality markers into projection. So uh, this is a project where one of, one of my colleagues replaced the infrared LED in a Pico uh, projector, one of the channels of a Pico projector, uh, and these two separate projectors can uh, start to interface. Uh, and again, pushing, pushing the screen out and, and, and away and, and focusing more on the, the human to human interaction and less on the human to computer interaction. And this is one of our more recent projects. It's called Ariel. Uh, what we're doing here is creating vor vortex rings, uh, and it's, uh, it's part of a series of projects that, uh, that we've started that we're referring to as free air haptics. So this is an opportunity to create haptic feedback uh, uh, out in space. And what's happening here is these five speakers are all being driven simultaneously, compressing air in this chamber, forcing it through this nozzle here with the pan and tilt motor, uh, and, and shooting out a vortex that looks uh, a lot like this here. Uh, there's some smoke added for visualization. And the reason that we're doing this is, as you've seen earlier, uh, there's a lot of interest in free air sensing. The Kinect, uh, there's a time of flight camera uh, that's, that's placed on these devices, but it's the same kind of thing. Depth cameras are becoming increasingly common tools for interaction and, and sensor input. But they have, there's, no, there's no way to get that sort of feedback. I might you know, click on something, swipe across to change the, the page on my television with, uh, with a depth camera there, but how do I know that I've actually successfully clicked on that? And this is an attempt to resolve that problem. 
And now one of the interesting things is uh, to build this project, we used uh, a multi-material 3D printer and went through hundreds of prototypes to develop the nozzle shape to get the vortex just right. Uh, so this is one of those cases where we're using 3D printing as a prototyping tool to, to, to make something work. Ultimately, it would probably be manufactured uh, if you're making thousands of these using more traditional manufacturing techniques, but uh, for a small R&D group of, you know, just uh, our, our, our interaction group is only about 10 people at most uh, at any one time, it would not be possible to develop a project like this in-house. We would have to couple with another group, but having the 3D printer in-house uh, allowed us to, to go through and develop this project. <clears throat> okay, so that's the quick overview of the Disney Research Pittsburgh Interaction Group projects, uh, with the exception of printed optics. And this, is, this has been my focus, uh, along with my colleague, Carl Willis. And what we're interested in is, uh, as the other speakers have discussed, starting to fabricate things using these uh, new additive manufacturing techniques. And why is this important? Uh, this is from 2012, that's uh, Obama saying, 3D printing has the potential to revolutionize the way we make almost everything. It's a pretty bold statement, uh, maybe is not, uh, it's a little bit hyperbole, it's taking it a little bit too far, but uh, I think his heart's in the right place and uh, the funding is in the right place. The, the United States government is good, putting uh, a good amount of money into research and uh, development on additive manufacturing. So what we were interested in is the same idea of going from a, an assembled device to a device that's fully printed from the ground up, and in some cases, uh, integrating electronics into that print. But we're looking, uh, our, our approach looks uh, at optically clear material. Um, everything that I'm gonna show from here on out is using a UV-cured photopolymer, which is printed on uh, an object, now Stratasys machine, which you've seen all the, the parts up here, and Ofer will tell you a lot more about it when he's up here, but um, yeah, so this, uh, it's, a, it's a really nice material, great quality. Uh, this little sphere here was 3D printed, but then polished to, to get that nice surface finish. So the first part of printed optics, uh, we break up into three components. There's uh, displays, sensors, and illumination. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about the uh, displays section first. So we created what we're calling light pipes, and they're just uh, 3D printed light guides. Just, uh, just consider them fiber optics, but they're all manufactured uh, in one pass on the 3D printer. And the enabling technology here was, uh, was using a, a two-material 3D printer. So what we're able to do is print a core uh, fiber optic, a cladding material with a slightly different index of refraction, and then encase that all in that hard, uh, the same material as that, that core material uh, on the outside to give it a rigid structure. So we're integrating optics and structure in the same object. Um, and uh, what that affords are fun little interactive toys. And because we're at Disney, we have to make cute little toys. That's kind of the name of the game. Uh, so from here on out, you'll see lots of cute little guys. And what we're doing is taking projected light from a Pico projector and just uh, pulling that up onto the surface of these eyes. And here you can see our, uh, our actress uh, asking, the, asking the little monster to wake up. He looks around. It's a little interactive experience. It's fun. Um, something else that we did with these displays where we created a, a set of chess pieces with um, an infrared reflective marker on the bottom. And these were put on a surface uh, computer. So you can move these chess pieces around. The, the surface would know where the, the pieces were uh, in relation to the board. Could give you a suggested move. Um, if you could pretty much just play as the computer. It was a way of building a tangible uh, interactive uh, device. The next thing that we were able to do were, were build internal reflectors. Uh, to do this, what we did was uh, remove support material and printed uh, with just that optically clear outside material. But the nice thing about 3D printing is we're also able to, to, to focus on the internal geometry. 
if you were injection molding or roto molding uh, or any number of other traditional manufacturing techniques, you may not be able to affect the internal geometry in the way that uh, 3D printing allows you to do. Uh, what we did with this, uh, we created a low-resolution 3D display, uh, and we're taking projected light and reflecting it off of those, uh, those pixels. Here you can see the, the, those uh, pi uh, pixels, voxels in space, and the light reflecting off of them. We also then took those, extruded them up, and created 3D shapes like the heart on this guy. This is another cute little character, always key. Um, and uh, again, it's a, the, the enabling technology here is, is 3D printing and being able to focus on that internal geometry. Um, yeah, we just built this uh, little stand. The entire character is 3D printed, painted afterwards, uh, and then the heart lights up and, and it beats. We also created a series of sensors using the same technology, and here we're going to start integrating some electronics in with our, with our prints. Um, and the first set of sensors that I'm going to talk about are displacement sensors. So what we're doing is creating light guides, just, uh, just like we were with the, the light pipes, and uh, displacing the light pipes using mechanical motion, like this button here, where you can just push the, 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 the light pipe down and just release it back up. Creates, uh, this is an animation. Um, it's a pretty simple concept, but it, it works surprisingly well as a, as a quick prototype button. So maybe we wanted to go in and prototype different buttons on top, different sliders. Uh, this is an accelerometer, so it's got a weighted end here. There's an infrared LED and an infrared receiver, which uh, is uh, what makes this possible. <clears throat> We're also using two materials, again, to uh, both allow light to pass and to mask material selectively so that we can create scroll wheels and uh, a different type of slider. So here you can see the scroll wheel uh, and a, a slider. Um, a, a different type of uh, sensing here is uh, non-mechanical. So we're doing what's called frust uh, using uh, frustrated total internal reflection. That's that FTIR down there at the bottom. And what we're doing is we're taking light that's bouncing through this optically clear print, uh, reflecting it off of a finger onto a receiver, and able to get uh, a nice pressure sensor uh, just on the top of this, this static surface. And what we did was we, we took that, uh, we created a reflector, uh, we put a, an infrared LED in the middle, uh, four receivers on the outside, and printed up our own little D-pad that you can see here that's super robust, fully enclosed, uh, and as you can see, it works fairly effectively. We took some of these same ideas and uh, decided to make uh, a series of lights. And this was just really a fun side design project. Uh, it's another nice thing about working for, for Disney Research is they allow us to, to take some of these ideas that might have more specific Disney applications and uh, start having fun with, uh, with them. So we do some art projects, we do some design projects, and uh, this is one of the design projects. So part of the, the lighting elements were we, we built some lenses. Uh, and this is the, the basic structure for, for building the lens. Um, and here's a quick video. We uh, were able to create uh, plano concave, plano convex, and, and prism lenses here. And one of the problems that we were having uh, was you know, we're, we're polishing the outsides of these parts, but we were never able to get onto the, to the inside to clean these pieces up. Um, and I'll show you uh, a little bit towards the end. We, we created a pretty nice solution for that. This is what the process looks like. Uh, this is the model in the uh, object software. Here's a, a time lapse of the, the part being printed. We uh, pause the print, drop our components in, seal it up so it makes it super robust. So you just have the two leads sticking out the side, polish that part, and, and kind of looks like that. Um, like I said, we created these light bulbs that uh, uh, where we took those light pipes and those internal reflectors and made these really sort of beautiful uh, adaptations for the uh, LED light bulbs, which can be kind of ugly. One of the nice things about uh, this project was we were able to pause the print on some of these and drop hardware directly into the, into the print. Um, so we use a parametric modeling tool called Grasshopper quite a bit. We use Python uh, for scripting. 
Uh, we do a lot of uh, electronics work and prototyping, um, but I, I'd like to echo the, the statement of our previous speaker about the importance of, of code and uh, integrating with, with design. I think uh, all of these tools, 3D printing, uh, accessible uh, programming platforms, have sort of have flattened the, the space that the designers can work in. They can start to leach into the manufacturing, start to leach into the uh, interaction design and programming, the software engineer, um, and have a more active role uh, beyond just design. And I think that's, that's uh, one of the really powerful uh, things about 3D printing. Oh, sorry, turns on at the end. Um, <laughs> So some of the challenges and limitations, uh, we're, we're limited right now to the, to the resolution of the, the printers, which is actually really, really good. So this is uh, at one millimeter. Uh, in, in, in software, those look like perfect circles, and in reality, you can see the materials don't behave exactly as we'd like them to uh, on that, that micron scale. But they do pretty well. So uh, we lose a lot of light uh, through our light pipes. Um, over distances above 100 millimeters, uh, even less. But uh, for, for us, for really small parts, toys, eyes, uh, this works just fine. So, and uh, we're not terribly concerned about it. Um, getting back to the lenses, uh, this is a, a comparison of the, the two lenses. Um, so we created a, a, a technique for surface smoothing within the print. And, and on the right, that's what, you, that's what you get directly off the 3D printed, so you can see the contours, the layers of the print building up. And normally you'd want to get in and polish that. With the optically clear materials, you want to create a really nice, seamless, continuous surface. But if, you're, if that's on the inside of the part, there's, there's nothing you can do. You can't get in there if it's all going to be sealed up. Uh, so what we found was if we, and it was completely by happenstance, uh, if you raised the, 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 the machine up a little bit and dumped material from a certain height, a certain number of layers, you could create uh, internal surface smoothing. It's not the, the most precise technique, but it worked for us and for what we were trying to do with the lenses. So I don't know about printing uh, lenses for glasses. We're not, uh, we're not doing that, but uh, yeah, for, for little uh, adapters for LEDs and... Uh, these little guys that work just fine. So that was our printed optics project, and I, I took some of those uh, same ideas, specifically the light pipes, and was asked within Disney to to build some uh, some eyes for uh, for some fun little characters and make make some fun little demos. And the challenge was. Uh, creating spherical eyes. It wasn't uh, it wasn't a, just a, a, a simple solution. Um, and this is what we ended up with. So typically displays uh, can be planar, they could be a ruled surface, or they could be a doubly curved surface, okay? And what you have with, with uh, planar and doubly curved surfaces is a lot of distortion towards the edges, right? So this is taking projected light and uh, trying to, to project a uh, circular image. And uh, you, can, you can deal with this by using light pipes uh, to, to bring the light up from a projection surface up to the display surface, which is what we're doing here. And for those two samples, uh, the planar and singly ruled surface, uh, traditional grid structures, traditional lattices, these uh, Bravis lattices work just fine, and we use the, the hex lattice and the square lattice mostly. But that doesn't really work for doubly curved surfaces. So uh, again, what we did, we looked to, to nature and uh, found that Fibonacci spirals uh, seem to, to work as both a 2D and a spherical packing scheme. So here's a semi uh, two-dimensional uh, Fibonacci spiral. Here's a spherical Fibonacci pattern. Um, and what that allowed us to do, to do was uh, create even point distribution across the sphere. Uh, and uh, optimal packing connection between the 3D surface and the 2D projection surface. Uh, and it allowed us to build a model that was scalable, so we could create something with 1,000 pipes or 2,000 pipes or 25 pipes. So this is what our, our base geometry looks like. Uh, it's a uh, Fibonacci, uh, Fibonacci pattern with a Voronoi tessellation, so each of our pipes is a unique shape. That's another thing about 3D printing 
is you're able to create uh, unique geometry throughout the print, as uh, some of the other speakers have talked about. So we took that, we extruded those pieces up to a uh, spherical Fibonacci sequence. And as you can see, the, the pixel size towards the edges is, uh, is approximately the same area as what you're getting at, at, the, uh, at the poles. Uh, we then take that and can bend it around towards a, uh, a projection, a, uh, a, in our case, a Pico projector. And finally, uh, we, we add a diffuser on top to uh, uh, take the light and re-emit it. So, uh, again, these are uh, uh, scalable. We're able to, to take our model and uh, build as many pipes, uh, as few or as many as we want with just uh, a single pass. We can, we can build these really quickly. It takes about four hours to print. The pipes themselves can be turned normal to the display surface. So with traditional fiber optics, everything's just gonna be uh, clumped, to, clumped together and a straight extrusion. But what we are able to do is turn the pipes normal to the surface, and that's also one of the things that allows us to get uh, that isotropic uh, distribution, and it limits pinching in the pipes. Um, and again, uh, each pipe across the, across the sphere is, is unique. So we took those, and uh, of course, since we're Disney, we created cute characters. So that's uh, Beep, Boop, and Iggy in the middle. And um, we created uh, expressive eyes for these guys. And uh, we looked at Japanese animation at uh, sort of creating uh, eyes that would be uh, very expressive and tell a story without uh, any other movement. So telling a story just through the eyes. And here you can see, uh, this is a dancing uh, robot. So you dance in front of them and you get this uh, reward at the end, the trophy, if you dance enough. Uh, also another key, having cute kids in your video always helps, especially selling things internally. They like that, cute kids. That's my niece. Um, so we took this and presented it at SIGGRAPH this past year. Within the box, we have a depth camera and the, and the Pico projector. Ultimately, we'd like to take that and, and make it a little bit smaller and fit directly into to our little uh, printed characters there. Um, here's the other example that's, uh, yeah, it's uh, the eye and then a separate soft uh, print, which uh, you'll, you'll see some of the soft materials up here. And this, the last thing I'm going to talk about with this, uh, this project is we were able to take that and uh, um, make an, both an input and an output device. So we're able to display and get touch input on these 3D printed pieces. Uh, what we're doing is we're taking a half-silvered mirror and uh, infra infrared light, an infrared camera, and a Pico projector uh, to both view the touch input and project uh, information back on. So here you can see we're tracking a finger uh, across the, uh, the surface of the, uh, of the printed piece. So printed touch screens, that's what we're kind of calling that. And that's it. That's all I have for now. I'll take, I think, two minutes of questions. Who's got a question for Eric? Eric, you were talking about depth sensors in, uh, they're going to be coming into uh, cell phones. Yep. Uh, and I think Samsung's already got a depth sensor, and a depth sensor basically allows you to, to do a kind of scanning. Are you working on any kind of applications for that in, in, in sort of more of the online world than, than these sort of figurines? In uh, we, we don't do a lot with mobile devices. I think uh, a lot of the research in that area is taken up by you know, companies like Motorola and uh, Google. Apple, um, so I mean, more like Disney content kind of thing. Disney content, uh, always. I mean, that's that is the the Disney bread and butter is is, is content. But um, yeah, I don't know specifics uh, about about what's what's happening in that realm. We at, at uh, Disney Research Pittsburgh aren't doing anything specifically. Okay, another question. Yeah, you beat me. Hi, Eric. Um, I was wondering, you were earlier mentioning about dropping hardware directly into the printing process. What happened to the hardware when it sort of died? Uh, 
what happened to the hardware when it was uh, when, when it like broke. Bur burned out or yeah. broke? I mean, it seals it in there, so it's it's uh, um, permanently. It, it, it's it's uh, there's nothing else you can do. I mean, you could cut it out, but it 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 kind of makes a, a hybrid part that's that's uh, fully sealed and not removable. I mean, you could make this. Uh, some of the the earlier mechanical sensors that we did were multiple parts, so we were able to go back and remove parts, add them back in. Um, but uh, yeah, the the more robust FTIR sensors are all fully encased. Thank you, Eric. Welcome.